Good afternoon, everyone. You're probably wondering what does it mean when I speak about the Herodian mind. Now, we're living in very, very strange times. And the times we are living in not only affect us, but affect the entire world. And before they killed Tyndall, he had one last prayer. And he said, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. And so before I start this lecture, not that I want to be in Tyndall's character, <laughs> in shoes, but before I start this lecture, I also would like to pray and ask the Lord for a special favor. So if you will allow me. Heavenly Father, throughout the ages you have wanted the eyes of those that do not see to be opened. And today I want to pray that you will open the eyes of your church. And that you will not only open the eyes of your church, but that you will open the eyes of the whole world, so that the gathering may commence. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now that might seem like a somewhat strange preamble to some, but in today's world, and in today's climate of cooperation and ecumenism, it is not politically correct to speak about the issues pertaining to the three angels' messages. And this is causing quite some consternation. There are even some who believe that prophecy being conditional, the issues regarding the Antichrist and what the Reformers believed regarding the papal system that that doesn't apply because it could be a conditional prophecy and it might never happen. Perhaps it only has an eschatological future, but not for the here and now. So today we can be in ecumenical sessions as whatever, guests or as observers, but it doesn't really pertain to us. There are some to say that say, we should not preach on the issue of the Antichrist and the three angels' messages in the way that we do because it is offensive. We should have other ways of preaching this issue. And some will say it's not part of our 28 fundamental beliefs. And if you study them carefully, it doesn't say so. It says that the reformers believe that the papal system was antichrist, but it doesn't pertinently say we still believe it, although it is there, of course, in the spirit of prophecy. But if you say that the spirit of prophecy cannot be used in that sense, well, then you don't really have a leg to stand on, and it opens the floodgates, and anything can come into the church. And so today, when you start speaking on these issues and you link history, and you link current events to the prophecies, they have a nice catchphrase for it, and it's called conspiracy theories. <laughs> have you heard that? Yes. yes, it's called conspiracy theories. And some will warn and say that we shouldn't be associated in any way with these conspiracy theories. Now, I don't deny the fact that there are conspiracy theories out there. But I do deny the fact that a clear exegesis of the Bible linked to current events is not conspiracy, but fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. And so, this is quite a problem to me. And when some of our leading men write that we should not look at current events and watch the news to see what is happening, because then we are inclined towards these conspiracy theories, and please do not support anyone that does this kind of thing. Or when even leaders start discussing this issue and saying that those who propagate any such ideas should really not be tolerated, then uh, it is time to take a deeper look. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak about the issue first in the philosophical sense and see where it leads. And then, hopefully, we can come to some kind of conclusion as to where we are in the stream of time and where it fits into prophecy. If some would want to call this conspiracy, they may. If some of them would rather see it as a confederacy, then they may too. I see it as a fulfillment of prophecy, and I see it as a fulfillment of the Word of God, and I can see that we are heading towards the very final events on this planet. Eight testimonies. There is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the school of the prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations were traced the footsteps of Jehovah. So today we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence in the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events in the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict for the great, of the great controversy. That's a commission. And that is a commission which is in direct contradiction to the sentiments that I have just spoken about. We have an injunction, if we are watchmen on the walls of Zion, to watch the events of history and to fit them into prophetic pictures or else we could just miss the bus. I wouldn't like anyone to miss the bus and particularly my church. I fear for my church when they marginalize the third angel's message and the second angel's message. Let us go back in history. This is the god Marduk, and he had a sign which was the sign of Anu. He also has a sword, and he has a trident, two tridents in fact here, which are in actual fact thunderbolts. You will find this deity as you go through the various cultures in many, many forms. You will find the deities throwing their thunderbolts, from the Zeus of the Greeks all the way through the, the cultures of the world. Now, many of these legends have their origin in some reality. And the origin goes back all the way to the very beginning. You see, the god Marduk was the son of Anu. And he had the commission, he received the commission to rule over evil. So the earth and the creation and everything that was here was evil. And he received authority from God to rule over the darkness and the evil. And his sign is embroidered here on the hem of his coat and upon his arm. He has the mark of authority to rule over the powers of evil. Now, if you go back into history, some will claim that this is actually a reference all the way back to the beginning and the story of Cain and Abel. Here is the god Shamash, and here he has the symbol of Anu, this eight-pointed star, which was two crosses, as it were. The wavy line represents the female, and the straight lines represents the male principle, because these deities were always in consort. They were male, and they were female. Now, Ishtar was the queen of the night, as she is called in the British Museum, and she also had a star, and as you can see, it is the same symbol. It is the sign of Anu. And she also ruled the night. And you find her in all the different cultures. 
When you go to Egypt, it will be Isis and Horus, the son, and Osiris, the father, who then became reborn as the son. So these were the deities that ruled over evil and had the authority from the creator God to rule over the children of evil. And so they have probably got their origin in a greater reality. Now when you look at the laws and the structures that they evolved to rule over people, then we find some interesting facts here. This is one of the earliest laws known, the Code of Hammurabi. It is well preserved, the Babylonian law code, and it dates back to 1772 BC. It's one of the oldest deciphered writings of significant length in the world. It's the sixth Babylonian king, Amurabi, enacted the code. In partial copies exist on a human-sized stone stele in various clay tablets. Now the code consists of 282 laws with scaled punishments, adjusting an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as graded depending on social status, slave versus free man. Nearly one half of the code deals with matters of contract, establishing, for example, the wages to be paid to an ox driver or a surgeon. So these are laws of government. Do they remind you of laws today? Do we have laws governing all these things coming into existence in the world all over? Big statute books of law. So they dealt with many, many things. So they dealt with economic measures, they dealt with labor questions, they dealt with uh, penal punishments for various crimes. Other provisions set the terms of a transaction establishing the liability of a builder for a house that collapses. Do we have laws like that today? For example, or property that is damaged while left in the care of another. Do we have laws like that today? A third of the code addresses issues concerning household and family relationships such as inheritance, divorce, paternity, sexual behavior. Do we have laws like that today? Only one provision appears to impose obligations on an official. This provision establishes that a judge who reaches an incorrect decision is to be fined and removed from the bench permanently. A handful of provisions address issues related to military service. And then it is signed with the following. On this, on this stella it says, Anu and Bel called by, my, called by name me Hammurabi the exalted prince who feared Maduk, the chief god of to bring about the rule in the land. So they had the power to rule. They had their capacity to rule from the highest authority, who they said was God. God gave them the power to rule. Now, if we go to our Bible commentary, we'll see that the Code of Hammurabi, Rab Hammurabi was one of the oldest collections of laws, but there were others as well that were older than that. It was written in Sumerian, this one, and then uh, it was discovered near Baghdad, and then the Code of King Balama of Eshuna, who ruled some 300 years before Hammurabi was found, and then another law was found, that of Urnamu, and it's fascinating that the further you go back in history, the more similarity there is between God's law and the laws of the nation. So as people moved away further and further from allegiance to God's law, the laws became more and more and more intrusive and more complex. But these people who had these laws ruled with an iron fist over the people of the earth, authorized by God. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, And thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So, let's go back to the earliest times. Here was a power in heaven, Lucifer, 
and he wanted to be in charge. He wanted to sit in the seat that God occupied. Har, mountain, that means a kingdom, the parallel in the Bible. So he wanted to sit upon the kingdom of God, as it were, and he wanted to be part of this congregation. So by implication, an assembly, the congregation, a place of meeting or a signal, appointed place, assembly, feast, season, solemn synagogue. He wanted to rule over the people. He wanted to have rulership. Well, we know what happened to him. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and they were cast out. And then he came down to this earth, and there was Adam and Eve. And then he worked on their minds, and he deceived them, and he became the ruler of this planet. But God had a way out, and God devised the plan of salvation. And in Genesis chapter 3, 15, we read, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In James 4, verse 4, it says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we have two groups. We have the world and we have God's people. Do God's people have a law? Yes, God's people have a law. And it's the law, as we find it in the Bible, which defines character, the Ten Commandments. And... Is there a war between good and evil? Yes, it's called enmity between thee and the woman, God's people, those who belong to God's church, the woman. So they are subject to a law. They have a covenant with God. But they are not taken out of this world. They are part of this world. And they are living in a world that is ruled not everywhere or hardly any place by God's people. Is that right? So the others are ruling. With what authority are they ruling? And how are they ruling? We'll have to look into that issue. But the fact of the matter is that what the world does and how the world thinks should be opposite to what God's people do and think. Now many of the laws of the land are of course the same as those that God's people would keep. For example, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, and all of these. And as long as the law doesn't interfere with God's law, God says you must obey the public authorities. So you must be part of the system without becoming engrossed in the system. Now we read that this declaration, I will put enmity, was not only a declaration of war, but it was the first gospel preached, the first gospel sermon ever preached to fallen man. This promise was the star of hope, illuminating the dark and dismal future of the race. Adam gladly received the welcome assurance of deliverance and diligently instructed his children in the way of the Lord. So here was... A chance, a way out. Struct your children. The promise was presented in close connection with the altar of the sacrificial offering. You cannot separate the two. Salvation always lies outside of ourselves. It is in Christ. The altar and the promise stand side by side, and one casts clear beams of light upon the other, showing that the justice of an offended God could be appeased only by the death of his beloved son. So if you are in Christ, you are linked to the sacrifice. In the case of Cain and Abel, we have a type of two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. And this type 
is worthy of close study. So this is strike two. We have to study history. We have to study the dealings of God with the nations. We have to study the providences of God in current times and apply them to what God has promised would happen. That's prophecy. And we are to study these two archetypes. It's part of our, our job description. Cain represents those who carry out the principles and works of Satan. By worshipping God in a way of their own choosing. It doesn't say they don't worship God. It says they worship God in a way of their own choosing. This is very important. So you can have godly people or apparent godly people out there, but they are worshipping God in a way of their own choosing and not in a way that God said he should be worshipped. And we need to be very clear about this distinction. Like the leader whom they follow, they are willing to render partial obedience, but not entire submission to God. The Cain class of worshippers includes by far the largest number. So anywhere you go, God's people will be outnumbered. Is that a fact? And so we are outnumbered, and yet we are not taken out of the world. We are in the world, but shouldn't be part of the world. For every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle. Every false religion that has ever been invented is based on the Cain religion. Now, just help me here. To the law and the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, they have no light in them. Should it be difficult to determine which religion is based on the Cain principle and which religion is based on the God principle? Don't we have a guide whereby to determine this? Now don't get me wrong. If the vast majority of mankind belongs to the worship of the Cain principle, does that mean we isolate ourselves from this group and have nothing to do with them? Well, then I would still be part of the Cain principle, wouldn't I? Because I came out of the world. And so would most of you be part of the Cain principle, isn't that correct? So we don't want to be part of the Cain principle, and God in his mercy makes a way of escape for everyone who's part of the Cain principle. So you never write them off, but you may never ever forget whose principle you fall under. Okay? So every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle that man can depend upon his own merits and righteousness for salvation. Every false religion. Genesis chapter 4 verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, because his sacrifice wasn't accepted. He brought the fruits of his labor and said, There it is. Now had God instructed them on the plan of salvation. Absolutely. The very clothes they're wearing, skins, in this picture tells you that God instructed them. The lamb had already pointed ahead to the coming of the Lamb of God. And they must have been instructed that without the shedding of blood, there will be no remission of sins pointing to the Lamb of God. So here Cain and Abel are bringing their various offerings, the one according to the dictates of God, the other one according to his own dictates. And when it happened that he wasn't accepted, Cain's, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Now there are some, I'm not too averse to the idea, that think, well, maybe Cain even justified his act 
maybe they thought that uh, one of them would be a blood sacrifice. Maybe he slew him, even thinking, well, if God, if you want a blood sacrifice, why take a lamb? Why not give you the real thing? So it doesn't seem as though he had great repentance. He had sorrow for what he had lost, but not sorrow for what he had done. Is that correct? I'm not saying it was so. It was a, probably a fit of rage, but in some way he must have justified it. And God came to him and said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, and hast opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto her a strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be on the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Is there any sorrow in that? No, he has a problem with the punishment. He doesn't necessarily have a problem with what he did. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid. And I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. I'm now an outcast. What am I going to do? Now God in his foresight sees that the children of disobedience are going to eventually be far more than the children of obedience. Isn't that right? And somebody has to rule. And if he puts the minority in charge of the majority, eventually all the ables that are there will be slain. Is that a possibility? And so God has to find a solution. Who's going to rule over the children of evil? Who's going to do it? They will slay me. And so God makes a covenant with Cain. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Now there's been a lot of speculation as to what the mark of Cain is, but we only have to look at the words to get an idea as to what the mark of Cain is. The mark, the word, is interesting because it's the Hebrew oath. If you would take it straight into the English, it would be oath, but of course we're not going to do that lest we get theologically slaughtered. We'll just say that the Hebrew is oath, which means a signal as a flag, a beacon, a monument, a prodigy, an evidence, a mark, a sign, a token. Now if we go to Exodus 31, 13, where we're talking about the children of God, it says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign, and the word there is oath. Same word. Exactly the same word. Between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Two signs. One the mark of Cain. The other one, the mark of God's people. The mark of God's people points to the Sabbath. The Sabbath tells you where you come from, and the Sabbath tells you in Deuteronomy that you are redeemed. You have been bought with a price. So here are God's people. They have the oath of God. They are keeping the commandments of God. They are in the minority. When Cain sinned, one of Adam's rebellious daughters sided with him. I'm speculating, of course, and decided that she was more affiliated to him than to the others and went with him. If he goes, I go. He must have gotten a wife somewhere, right? And so the family split up. Doesn't say so in the Bible, but it's a logical deduction. And those that fell under the rule of Cain received the mark of Cain, and those that fell under the rule of God had a simple sign of obedience to God's commandments right from the very beginning. And I think that that is 
a logical conclusion. So the mark is not some physical stamp or sign that he had. It is a mark of authority. Because the Sabbath is a sign of authority, therefore the mark of Cain must be a sign of authority. This one acknowledging the authority of God, and this one acknowledging no higher authority than himself. So it's two authorities. The one falls subject to God, the other one falls subject to the mark of Cain. So they will set the authority, they will set the tone. And vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Don't mess with Cain. If Cain catches you in a transgression against him, he'll punish you seven times. He has the authority. Don't mess with him. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. So now the children of disobedience start growing. And I'm sure there were other defectors along the line. And Cain's family grew much faster than that of the Lord's people. Adam and Eve tried their best to stem the tide. So this firstborn of Cain, his name was Enoch, not to be confused with the other Enoch, because this one didn't walk with God. This one started to build cities. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad began Mewayal, and Mewayal, Methusael, and Methusael beget Lamech. And the rot sets in. And Lamech took unto him two wives. So now we have apostasy increasing. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And then it gets even worse. Verse 23, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man. Here's another murderer in the line of Cain. But he is an inheritor of the authority, because this is going down the sons of Cain. To my wounding and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So the rules will get tougher, but not only that. I was interested in this seventy and sevenfold, and I looked for a translation because it's hard to determine what it is. I like the Geneva Bible, and as you know, that is the old Bible, so the spelling looks funny, but... Uh, if Cain shall be, in the old days that was one word, <laughs> if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy times sevenfold, says the Geneva Bible. I like that. Seventy times seven. Does that ring a bell? It rings a bell somewhere? Oh. What happened at the end of the 70 times 7 that you find in the book of Daniel? Probation closed for the Jews as a nation. Not as individuals, but as a nation. So if Cain was to have a sevenfold structure, then Lamech would have a 70 times 7 structure, but it would only last until God said, probation for you is closed. Does that make sense? I'm speculating. It's a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, does seem that these words are not just arbitrary. Now, Let's jump straight into the esoteric world and let me just make plain again that my sources will be the very best sources for those who want to make them obscure. I will quote from the highest occult sources in the world and I will quote from encyclicals directly from the Vatican so that anybody who wishes to say that these are not authoritative had better 
check them out and see whether it is so. Morals and dogma, Albert Pike. You know what's fascinating? Is that the esoteric world doesn't deny the Bible. It just twists the Bible. It doesn't deny the chronology of the Bible. The evolutionists deny the chronology of the Bible. The esoteric world knows that the Bible is true. That's fascinating. Now, Morals and Dogma, Albert Pike, he says the following. Enoch. His name signified in the Hebrew, initiate or initiator. So he's the initiate of the initiator. The legend of the columns of granite and brass or bronze erected by him is probably symbolical. He's the one who built the city, remember? That of bronze which survived the flood is supposed to symbolize the mysteries of which masonry is the legitimate successor. So irrespective of the stuff in between those two points there, we can say, according to the occult world, Enoch is the initiate and the initiator, and Freemasonry is the inheritor of whatever it is that was initiated. Is that correct? Is that what he's saying? Good. So, Masonry traces its origin back to Enoch. High Masonry. From the earliest times, the custodian or masonry is the legitimate successor of the Enoch principle. From the earliest times, the custodian and depository of the great philosophical and religious truths unknown to the world at large. Unknown to the world at large. And handed down from age to age by an unbroken current of tradition. Uh, do we have a religious organization that uh, prides itself on its tradition? embodied in symbols, emblems, and allegories. So they trace themselves back from Enoch, and then they say Enoch walked with God and all these marvelous things. But don't believe everything these people say. Check it out. Do a careful study. So which Enoch are they talking about? Are they talking about the Enoch that walked with God? Or are they talking about the Enoch, the son of Cain? Well, we can find out. Enoch's son of Jared descended from Ab Adam via the line of Seth. So it's a different line. And he's called in the Bible the seventh generation from Adam. And if we use the chronology from Asher that even the spirit of prophecy used, then Enoch would have been born in the year 3382 B.C. That's now the Enoch that walked with God. Pike's book is dated Masonically, and it's dated by Christian reckoning. This is fascinating stuff. It has two dates. One is the Masonic date, and one is the Christian date. And the reckoning in Pike's book to Enoch is given as the year 5860 AM. And if you look that up, it means Anu Mundi, the year of the world. So when did the world as we know it begin, and when did this unbroken line of succession come down the line of history all the way to modern Freemasonry? According to Pike, it all started in the year 5860 Anu Mundi, year of the world. But it also has the normal date in it, and it says the book came, was written in 1871 AD. All right, so if I want to find out if 5860 Anno Mundi is the same as 1870 AD, then when was it BC? Well, then you have to subtract the one from the other, 5860 minus 1871 to get a BC date from an AD date, you get to the year 3809 BC. So the Masonic calendar starts in 3809 BC. And that is 427 years 
before the Enoch that walked with God. So the dates in the very high occult writings tell us that the Enoch that they refer to is which one? The Enoch of Cain. So this unbroken line of authority comes all the way from Cain. Now let's read The Secret Doctrine by Blavatsky. Because in the esoteric world, everything is turned around. Good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Let's just check this out once more. Once that the key to Genesis is in our hands, it is the scientific symbolical Kabbalah which un unveils the secret. The great serpent of the Garden of Eden and the Lord God are identical. And so are Jehovah and Cain one. So Cain is the God of this world who gave his power to rule to his son and he dedicated a city to him and he said there. Now a city also stands for a government, doesn't it? Isn't Babylon called a city? Yes or no? So if Babylon is called a city, and Enoch got the power to rule over the city, and the Lord God is the same as Cain, then it means that Cain gave his power to rule to his son Enoch. And the mark of Cain was transferred, the power and authority to rule was transferred from Cain to Enoch, and then in an unbroken line, all the way through to the modern world, according to them. That Cain, who is referred to in theology as the murderer and the liar to God, Jehovah tempts the king of Israel to number the people, and Satan tempts him to do the same in another place. Jehovah turns into the fiery serpent to bite those he is displeased with, and Jehovah informs the brazen serpent that heals them. These short and seemingly contradictory statements in the Old Testament, contradictory because the two powers are separated instead of being regarded as the two faces of one and the same thing, are the secret doctrine. So good is evil, evil is good. The Lord God is really Cain. So in that sense, Anu would be Cain. He's also the son of Ea, the moon goddess. Fascinating. Ea, Eve. And so there's an element of truth in these old legends. The appellation Satan in Hebrew, Satan, an adversary, from the word Shatana, to be adverse, belongs by right to the first and cruelest adversary of all the other gods, Jehovah. This is the secret doctrine. Not to the serpent who spoke only words of sympathy and wisdom and is the worst even in the dogma of the ad adversary of men. So the enemy is who? The enemy is God. So in the line of Cain, the true God is the enemy. In the line of Cain, the true God is the enemy. And if there is a godly person like Abel, if it is within his power, what will he do to him? He'll kill him. He'll kill him. That's his mindset. He wants to rule. He has the power to rule. He has an authority to rule. He can punish sevenfold, 70 times sevenfold. He can put you into jail and into misery for whatever and keep you there until you rot. He has the power to do it. And he hates the God of heaven. That's his mindset. Now deception, of course, is something that comes into play as well because many who are subject to the rule of the Cain stream, don't even know that they are part of the Cain stream. And so they are deceived into following this rule, whether they like it or not. Therefore Jehovah was called by the Gnostics, the creator of and one with Ophiomorphos, the serpent or Satan. So you have a reversal, a gospel reversal. Genesis chapter 6 verse 1. Now evil starts increasing on this planet. Cain rules with ruthlessness through his line. And by the time you get to Lamech, it is chaos and oppressive power. You mess with me, 
and my authority, I will sort you out. And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. So as I've said before, God's beautiful children go to do shopping in the mall, and there they see the daughters of men with their short little skirts and their tantalizing little ways. And before you know it, they intermarry. And the Lord says he will not strive with them forever. Your time shall be 120 years. And there were giants, Nephilim, apostates, not angelic people. That's wishful thinking on their part. No, there were apostates, Nephilim on the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God, the line of the children of Adam through the line of Seth, came unto the daughters of men and bare children to him, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So you had men who received great honor in the media. When you looked at the television set, the antediluvian set, you saw all the men of great valor and all the rulers, and they were the great philanthropists of the world, the powerful rulers, the presidents, the ones who were making the speeches. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And so when the 70 times 7 was full, he said probation for the antediluvian world is over. And he destroys them, except one family. Of course, Noah's family was all perfect, right? No, I think uh, there might have been some daughters there that were married to them. Who knows whether they were daughters of men or daughters of God. And perhaps the line of Cain came along with a ship. And the theology of Cain was in the ship. God is gracious, isn't he? God is gracious. Do we have a parallel anywhere else? Sodom and Gomorrah? Were they all perfect that were saved there? Or do we have Moabites and <laughs> Ammonites as a consequence? So the post-flood apostasy and the rule of Cain resumed then through the lineage of Ham. So the line wasn't actually broken. The apostasy, the great oppression, the great evil was arrested for a while. But it didn't take long before it flourished on the planet again. And finally, we come to the descendants of Ham, and we come to Nimrod. And Flavius Josephus writes of Nimrod. Now it was Nimrod who excited them to such an affront and contempt of God. He was the grandson of one of Noah's most wicked son, Ham. Therefore, great-grandson of Noah, a bold man of great strength of hand, he persuaded his people not to ascribe their joys to God as if it were through his means they were happy, but to believe that it was their own courage which procured that happiness. Do we have that same philosophy today? He also gradually changed the government into a tyranny. He had the same mindset. He had the same mindset seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God, but to bring them in constant dependence on his power. He also said he would be revenged on God if he should have a mind to drown the world again, and for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to reach, and that he would avenge himself on God for destroying their forefathers. Enmity towards God, enmity to anyone who opposes him in this issue, and he begins to rule. He is the legitimate heir then of the power to rule over the children of evil. Well, masonry actually in its writings says that the Tower of Babel was their enterprise. 
So if morals and dogma traces it back to Enoch, then other writers trace it back to Nimrod. But it's the same thing. The one just takes the post-flood reoccurrence, and the other one takes it from the pre-flood. And so the Tower of Babel is depicted as a Masonic enterprise. Arthur Edward Waite, as regards masonry, Babel, of course, represented a Masonic enterprise. It is well known that the Tower of Babel is one of the most ancient traditions of masonry. So they don't make any bones about it. In the Masonic quiz book, the question is asked, who was Nimrod? The answer was, he was the son of Cush, and the old constitution referred to as one of the founders of masonry. And in the scripture, as the architect of many cities, was Enoch an architect of cities? So here you have city dwellers and country mouse. <laughs> All right, we find at the making of the Tower of Babel, there was masonry. First much esteemed of, and Nimrod was a mason himself and loved well, masons. These are Masonic sources. Now, as we go down through history, we come to the various ruling powers, the superpowers of Earth that held sway. And we will find some parallels in all of them. They all received the same power to rule over the children of disobedience, those who chose their own way to worship God. If we go down in time to the history to the history of the Egyptians, Tut Moses III, he's the one who said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? He was the Napoleon of Egypt. He was the great lawmaker. Nobody stood in his way, or he would destroy them. And he made an anti-Sabbath law, as you will remember, when he said, you will not rest, you will not Shabbat, you will not keep the Sabbath, you will not rest, but you will get unto your burdens. And when he made laws which counted God's law, his authority was judged at an end by God. So who permitted him to rule until he overstepped the mark? God. God permitted him to rule. Did God permit the king of Egypt to even be the authority in terms of government procedures over his own children? Yes or no? Yes. Were they subject to the rules of Egypt? Yes. Did he have the power to even enslave them? Yes or no? Yes. Did he have the power to oppress them? The Bible says they were sorely oppressed. But there was a limit. 70 times 7. When your probation close, closes, you will be eradicated. So let's go away from Egypt and let's go to the Assyrians. This is history, grisly Assyrian record of torture and death. Assyrian national history as it has been preserved for us in the inscriptions and pictures consists almost solely of military campaigns and battles. When you look at the news today, do you see military campaigns and battles, yes or no? So it seems as if the, this line of power that rules over the children of disobedience has military might and military power and exercises that power even over the children of God. Is that right? Assyria emerged as a territorial state in the 14th century BC. Its territory covered approximately the northern part of modern Iraq. The first capital of Assyria was Assur, located about 150 miles north of the modern Baghdad. And there on the left is a relief of Assyrian torture. They would rip the skins of people off their bodies while they were alive. The Bible tells us that they took Manasseh with hooks through his nose and dragged him to Babylon. He must have had one painful nose. On the west coast of the Tigris River, the city was named for its national god Assur, from which the name Assyria is also derived. From the outside, Assyria projected itself as a strong military power bent on conquest. 
Countries and people that opposed Caesarian rule were punished by the destruction of their cities and the devastation of their fields and orchards. In the 9th century, Assyria had consolidated hegemony over the northern Mesopotamia. It was then that the Assyrian armies marched beyond their own borders to expand their empire, seeking booty to finance their plans for still more conquest and power. By the mid-19th century, the Assyrian menace posed a direct threat to the small Syro-Palestine states to the west, including Israel and Judah. So do they eventually try to take over God's people as well? Yes. And they have the line of authority because they are children of disobedience. And these are reliefs where we find the Assyrian armies. Here are the heads of the decapitated people that they decapitated. Here they are, the people are strung up on poles with spears all the way through them. The cruelest tortures that you can imagine. And people were scared of these rulers. If Cain shall be avenged seven times, Lamech seventy times seven times, if you don't fall subject to us, we'll show you what power we have. And we have authority. We have it directly by permission of God. Let's go to Roman law. By this time, the governments of the world have consolidated a legal system which is second to none. There's a law for every single transgression you can think of. There are penalties for moral deeds, which are just indescribable, and permissions for immorality, which are equally indescribable. Does it ring a bell? And how did they deal with dissenters in the Roman Empire? Well, you were thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. You were crucified on a cross. You were eaten alive by animals. You were whipped with whips until your entrails hung out. The cruelty was just indescribable. And their aggression, did their aggression turn against God's people? Yes or no? Yes, it did. But they ruled, and they had power to rule. Now let's have a look at one man who lived at that time, and his name was Herod the Great. He has been described as a madman who murdered his own family and a great many rabbis. If he murdered a great many rabbis, then did he have power to do so even over God's people, yes or no? Yes. Must have had. The evil genius of the Judean nation prepared to commit any crime in order to gratify his unbounded ambition. Any crime. And the greatest builder in Jewish history is known for his colossal building projects. Does this ring a bell, Enoch? Does this ring a bell, Nimrod? The great builders? So they love their cities. They love their great monumental buildings. He's known for colossal building projects throughout Judea, including his expansion of the second temple in Jerusalem. Now, excuse me, this man is a cruel, cruel ruler who has power to rule. God's people are even subject to him. And he's building a temple for the worship of Yahweh. The construction of the port at and Masada and Rhodium and all of these, and uh, he was a powerful man. The Herodian dynasty was a Judean dynasty of Edomite, Edomian descent. Herodian dynasty began with Herod the Great who assumed the throne of Judea, so he ruled over God's people with Roman support and bringing down the century-long Hasmonean kingdom. His kingdom lasted until his death in 4 BCE when it was divided between his sons as Tetrarchy, which lasted about 10 years. Most of those kingdoms, including Judea, were incorporated into the provinces, etc., etc. 
These Judaized Edomites were not considered Jewish by the dominant Pharisaic tradition. So even though Herod may have considered himself of the Jewish faith, he was not considered Jewish by the observant and national Jews of Judea. Could we say today that there are some people who consider themselves of the Christian faith, but those who believe in the law of God and the Torah do not really consider them of the same level of knowledge in terms of Christianity, yes or no? Is that possible? Now, Herod was a loyal supporter of Hyrcanus II. Antipater appointed Herod governor of Galilee at 25 and his elder brother governor of Jerusalem, and he enjoyed the backing of Rome. But his brutality was condemned by the Sanhedrin. He was brutal. He was a ruthless man. Two years later, Antigonus, nephew, took the throne from his uncle with the help of the Parthians, and Herod fled to Rome. And there he did some pleading with his Roman rulers to restore him to power. And there he was elected by the Roman Senate, king of the Jews. Now here was the king of the Jews. And uh, Josephus and the encyclopedias are the sources. And Romans 9.13 says, As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, does God hate people? Of course not. So what did God hate? He hated the mindset of Enoch. He hated the mindset of Enoch. And here was a man who claimed to be ruler over God's people, but he had the mindset of Enoch. And God hates that mindset. Did God permit him to rule? Yes. He permitted him to rule. His first leadership role was as governor of Galilee, a position granted to him by his father, Antipater. Early on, Herod demonstrated his brutality by ruthlessly crushing a revolt in Galilee. Later, during the Parthian incursion, he flees, makes his way to Rome, where he impresses Mark Antony, and with his help, persuades the Roman senators to name him king of the Jews, so he can return and bring Judea back under Roman control. And after three years of fighting, he takes the throne and he is officially king of the Jews. Can you see why he's upset when suddenly there's a rumor there's another king of the Jews? Matthew 2 verse 18, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted, for they are not. So he murders the little children in order to get rid of Christ, but he underestimates God. Does he persecute God's people? Yes. Does he hate this kind of opposition, godly opposition? Absolutely. Whose mindset does he have? He has the mindset of Cain. He has the mindset of Cain. He has the same power to rule. Who does he get his power from? Who lends him that power, gives him his title? Rome. Rome gave him his power, gave him his title. You're the king of the Jews. And so he built a temple. I'm the king of the Jews. I'll build a temple. And he builds a temple. But Herod saw fit, however, to place at the main entrance a huge Roman eagle. Who does he dedicate the temple to? Not to the God of the universe. He dedicates the temple, which stands for worship. He dedicates it to Rome. This is history. And the pious Jews saw this as sacrilege, as well they should. Here it was in symbols. Take it in antitype. Can we see God's worship dedicated to Rome today, yes or no? Wouldn't the pious Christians see that as sacrilege, yes or no? Okay. Two teachers and a group of Torah students smashed this emblem of idolatry and oppression, but Herod had them hunted down and dragged in chains to his residence in Jericho, where they were burned alive. 
Do you see his mindset? Do you know of Christians that were later burned alive because they had a different mindset to Rome? Thus, having built the temple, Herod took pains to make sure it would be run without future problems of this kind. You will worship your God according to my dictates. He appointed his own high priest, having by then put to death 46 leading members of the Sanhedrin, the rabbinical court. So by the time Jesus actually starts preaching, the good guys are all dead already. <laughs> They've been put to sleep. Herod's cruelty was legendary. I'm talking about the Herodian mind. But it's not isolated to Herod. It is a historic mindset that comes all the way from the Garden of Eden and runs with an unbroken chain all the way through history and to our present day. And we have to find the current custodians of this Herodian mindset. Now I chose Herod. I could have said the mind of Cain. But I find in Herod the culmination of history because it is Herod or his son who was also a Herod who even crucified the Prince of Peace. So this mindset, this enmity towards God's people, coupled with the power to exercise it under official authority, is mind-boggling. Because initially God granted Cain the mark of Cain, the authority to rule. And he established an enormous secret police force. I want you to look at history and let the bells start ringing. Brutally killed anyone suspected of plotting against him and created Roman peace by slaughtering all dissidents. We will have military intervention if you don't do as we say. Herod Antipas. The mindset continues. You remember the story of Herod, Herodias and Salome? I don't want to go into that typology, I've done it before. But the head of John the Baptist, give it to me. Now fortunately in our typology, this was a type of the Elijah, but there was also an Elijah that was translated without seeing death. So we will see. Some of us might end up being John the Baptist typologically, and some of us might end up, hopefully, being the other one, the one who did not see death. And this is Jesus before Herod Antipas. Can you imagine the king and the prince of the universe being arrayed before this earthly monarch? who is sitting there by whose authority? God's authority. He has been permitted to rule because God in his mercy doesn't want anyone to be lost. Now I want to ask you a question. Did God give Herod Antipas every single possible opportunity to repent, yes or no. What does that tell you about the character of God? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. And I want you to cast your mind back in history. The Babylonian Empire, where Nebuchadnezzar set up a system which was just the same as Herod's. Nebuchadnezzar had a secret police second to none. He knew everything that was happening in his kingdom. He was unbelievably cruel. If you crossed him, you ended up in the fiery furnace, alive, throw you in there. I don't care if my soldiers die in the process. He was a cruel man. He set up a counterfeit system of religion. Did God give him every opportunity to repent? Yes or no? Will he be in heaven? Yes. 
the Assyrians. If you go down in history, you come to Nineveh. Was there a ruler who repented at the preaching of Jonah? One of the cruelest of all rulers. I think his name was not Nari III. And all of a sudden, all history of his cruelty ceases, and there's no more war and total peace in his kingdom. Does God care about these rulers? Yes. And here he is arrayed before him. He gets a final opportunity. He sees the Prince of Peace. He sees those eyes. He sees them personally. And he has him mocked. And they put a reed in his hand. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. And they beat him over the head over and over and over again and say, prophesy who beat you over the head. This is the mind of Herod. It is a mind that has separated itself from God, but it has power to rule. And the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. If there is one thing that unites even the warring factions of the children of Cain, it's a common enemy. And if that common enemy is still the Prince of Peace or his followers, so much the better, because Cain slew Abel. And that animosity towards the truth is part and parcel of those who have the mark of Cain, all the way through. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great dragon having seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which, was, woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour a child as soon as it was born. Herod the first, and she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with an rod of iron, and a child was caught up unto God and to his throne." Here's the true ruler. His law is a law of justice and mercy. The other ruler also rules with a rod of iron, but he rules with a mark of Cain. And the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. Acts 4.26 For of the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. That's scary. That's scary. My question is the following. Can this mark of Cain even progress to within God's people itself? Men and children, brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you feareth God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So what is the criterion of these rulers? They knew him not. And they didn't know the prophecies either. They didn't know him. And they didn't know the prophecies. Should God's people know him and the prophecies? Yes or no? Okay. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He wasn't satisfied with killing the prince of peace and handing, over, handing him over, beaten to Pilate. No, no, he stretched his hand out towards the church because the mindset of Cain is slay Abel. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know for a surety that the Lord has sent his angel, because he imprisoned even Peter. I jumped a few verses there. And delivered me out of the hand of Herod, and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. Will there be persecution? Yes or no? Yes. Who is our only deliverer and our only hope in that persecution? Jesus. And I want you to remember that because we're going to go into very fine detail here. And we prayed that the eyes of this church and of the world will be opened 
And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, set upon his throne, and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God, and not of a man. Ooh, do we hear things like that? Someone today just from that little balcony opens his mouth and says, Cheap? They say, Oh, it's the voice of a God. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not glory to the Lord and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. There comes a time when the 70 times 7 is up and probation stops for the rulers who rule under the power of the mark of authority given by God to Cain to rule over the children of evil. I exhort therefore that first of all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. Do you understand that verse a little bit better? We must pray that God will curtail them in their animosity towards God's people so that the work of God can continue that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Saviour. God has handed over the children of evil to the rules of evil. You know, my wife gave classes, she was a school teacher, in a very, very, very depressed, unruly, very disenfranchised school and the children were incredibly unruly and violent. They had strangled a teacher, they had stabbed another teacher, the police were afraid to break up the gang fights in the school and she taught in that school. Now my wife is a timid lady and her authority counted for naught. And so one day she said to them, all right, you don't want to listen to my rules? Then you make the rules. And they said, okay. And they started making the rules. If you do this, then that happens to you. If you do this, and they made a long list of rules. The most draconian rules that you can imagine. Like if you chew gum or something, you will sweep the whole school with a toothbrush on your knees until the skin comes off. Rules like that. And they stuck to their rules. And there was harmony in the class. So when she couldn't rule over them, she handed them over to the mark of Cain and said, rule over the children of evil. And they said, we will increase the rules sevenfold, nay, seventy times seventy. <laughs> Is that, I thought that was a good example. And that's exactly what God did. He said, okay, you don't want to accept my authority? I'll hand you over to that authority. And behind that authority stands another authority. He's called the dragon. And he's blowing his evil breath upon them. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou thou not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And it works like that. If you do good, people despise you, but eventually they sort of respect you, especially when you're dead. Isn't that so? Yes, go and look at the monuments of all the great men that were hated and respected after their death. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So we are not in a perfect situation. God has given them the power to rule. We are subject to that rule, just like the children of Israel were subject to Pharaoh. There's nothing we can do about it, but we can pray. We can pray for them. And we can obey the rules of the land as far as they do not come into conflict with God's law. And then we must rely on God. That's the situation we are in. Now this is Shamsi Adat, 823, 811 BC. So here you have one of these great Syrian rulers. And notice what he has around his neck. 
And he is one of those powerful rulers, and there is the symbol of Anu, also the star of Ishtar. So there's a male deity and there's a female deity. And he has authority. Whose authority does he have and under whose mark does he rule? Under the mark of Cain. Now, we studied the, the esoteric writings and we saw where that led to, so let's go back to them. This is again morals and dogma. The degree rose, and then he uses the symbol. Is that the same symbol that uh, you saw in the Assyrian king? Yes. Teaches three things. The unity, immutability, and goodness of God. So there's an element of religion here. The immortality of the soul. Is it the true God or false God? It's a false God. And the ultimate defeat and extinction of evil and wrong and sorrow by a Redeemer or Messiah yet to come if he has not already appeared. Excuse me. Is this the same Messiah we're waiting for? No. So here is a religion, but it's not the religion of God. It's another religion. And it's a false religion. But this degree, the rose, uses this as its sign. And here are the symbols of the Rosicrucians. They use the phoenix rising out of the ashes, and they use the symbol of the pelican feeding its young. Now, without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption, and the lamb had to die in order to symbolize the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Here is a sacrifice which is made to feed the children, but the creature does not die. So it's a false religion. It's a false religion. And this was the symbol that was used at the last Olympics in London where the phoenix rises out of the ashes. So the rulers of the world used the symbol that is used in the Rosicrucian symbolism. So the current rulers of the world haven't suddenly changed. They haven't suddenly become God's people. If you go to Roman Catholicism, you find both of these emblems in the Roman Catholic Church. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat, and what? Great authority. Who, according to the scripture, wields the authority today? The beast. The beast. Now, every reformer said that this was Roman Catholicism. There's no doubt about it that this was Roman Catholicism. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, since I entered politics, I have chiefly had men's views confided to me privately. Some of the biggest men in the United States in the field of commerce and manufacture are afraid of somebody, are afraid of something. They know that there is a power somewhere so organized, so subtle, so watchful, so interlocked, so complete, so pervasive, that they had better not speak above their breath when they speak in condemnation of it. That was the President of the United States who handed over the financial power of the United States to the Federal Reserve. Fascinating. Liberty has never come from the government. This is the President of the United States speaking. Liberty has always come from the subjects of the government. The history of liberty is a history of resistance. The history of liberty is a history of the limitation of governmental power, not the increase of it. So when governmental power increases, they are exercising an authority. And it's an authority that comes all the way down from the line of Enoch. Here we have the Rosicrucians who use the very symbol, there it is, that we found on the Assyrian kings. And they are subject to the Roman sea. And today we have two popes ruling, although one sits on the throne, and both of them have these powers under their control. And here is the current general of the Jesuits, Adolfo Nicolas. And he rules over forces that we will see 
are all-encompassing. Now let's go to the great controversy. I specifically chose the great controversy because isn't this a project of this church? Just checking. <laughs> Throughout Christendom, Protestantism was menaced by formidable foes. Protestantism was menaced. The first triumph of the Reformation passed. Rome summoned new forces, hoping to accomplish its destruction. At this time, the order of the Jesuits was created. Now, please note, I'm not saying this. The most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. The most cruel. Cut off from every earthly tie and human interest, dead to the claims of natural affection, reason and conscience wholly silenced. They knew no rule, no tie, but that of their order and no duty was to extend its power. The gospel of Christ had enabled its adherents to meet a danger enduring suffering undismayed by cold hunger and toil poverty to uphold the banner of truth in the face of the rack, the dungeon, and the stake. To combat these forces, Jesuitism inspired its followers with a fanaticism that enabled them to endure like dangers and to oppose to the power of truth all the weapons of deception. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume, vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. It was this studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to the overthrow of Protestantism and the re-establishment of the papal supremacy. That's from the pen of inspiration. The Inquisition Inquisition was unscrupulous. It was cruel. Now the Jesuits were given the Inquisition in Rome, not to be confused with the Spanish Inquisition, which was run by the Dominicans. But in Rome, the Jesuits, at the heart of power, they were the Inquisitors. The tools they used for torture were horrendous. This thing was put around your neck and that screw tightened until your larynx gave way and you died. And it was used as recently as in the Franco Wars in Spain. They used the thumb screws. They tied people to a, a hoist and tied a heavy ball and then dropped it down so that their limbs would be ripped from their bodies. They burned people at the stake. The most incredible tortures. These are drawings and pictures of actual events that took place. This is how they tied them up and then they dropped that ball. They were so cruel, it is unbelievable. And the spirit of prophecy says these were the champions. And here you have the present black pope and the present white pope. And today we have some unprecedented history. We have two current popes. And we have, for the first time in history, two black popes. Because not only Ratzinger retired, but Peter Hans Kolvenbach also retired for the first time in history. Is the work so great that they have to divide the world into two parts? And they are at the disposal of this mighty machine. Here is the present Pope in the company of the Jesuits, because the first thing when a Pope is elected is he meets with the Jesuit generals and his highest authorities. Adolfo Nicolas, the black pope, and Bergoglio, the white pope. They seem very happy about something. Very happy. Both of them are Jesuits. Christian example of Pope Francis provides a contrast with the graceless. But who would ever have believed his successor could be a Francis from the ends of the earth, a Jesuit, and also ran in the 2005 conclave? The poorest of the poor know the great surprise about Francis is that he's so Christian. He walks the walk, so many prelates he content to just talk the talk. He has showed the trappings of his office to live frugally in Buenos Aires. He took the bus. But to go and visit the Pope just next door, he took the helicopter. <laughs> and he was elected on the 13th of the 3rd, 2013. Add the numbers, it comes to 13. 
and the smoke appeared at five past eight, add the numbers, it comes to 13. And yesterday he went to Assisi. And his departure time is exact and his return time is exact. He'll spend exactly 13 hours in Assisi. And his name is Francis. Is it Francis of Assisi? Or is it Francis Xavier, the co-founder of the Jesuit order, who ordered the Inquisition in Goa and proclaimed that all Sabbath keepers there should be destroyed? I am fascinated with this man. Here he is seen kissing the feet of prisoners. If you look carefully, he still wears his black robes under his white robe, as you can see over there. There's his symbol in the bus. I don't want to discuss that picture further. And let's read the great controversy. When appearing as members of the order, they wore a, go wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and to the poor. I'm reading from the great controversy professing to have renounced the world and bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good, but under this blameless exterior, the most criminal and deadly purposes were concealed. It was a fundamental principle of the order that the end justifies the mean. By this code, lying, theft, perjury, assassination were not only pardonable but commendable when they served the entrance of the church. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked their way into offices of state, climbing up to be the counselors of kings, shaping the policy of nations. They became servants to act as spies upon their masters. They established colleges for the sons of princes and nobles and schools for the common people and the children of Protestant parents were drawn into observance of popish rites. That's what the pen of inspiration tells us. Two swords. A medieval doctrine on the relation of church and state as explained by Pope Boniface VIII. We are taught by the word of the gospel that in this church and under her control there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. This is the Pope speaking. Both of these, the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. Who has the mark of authority? According to this, the church. Which church? Rome. The first is wielded by the church, the second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hands of the priests, the second by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. Sword must be sub subordinate to sword and is only fitting that temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. This doctrine was not defined by the Pope, but reflected the mentality of the age when both priests and kings were members of the same Catholic Church in whose name Pope Boniface was speaking. Father John Hansen, Modern Catholic Dictionary. This is their writings. They control the sword. They wield the sword of authority. They have the mark of power. This is the Pope's Bull unam sanctum. We are informed by the text of the Gospel that in this Church and in its power, are two swords, the spiritual and the temporary. For when the apostle says, behold, there are two swords, that is to say in the church, since the apostles were speaking, the Lord did not reply that there were too many, but sufficient. We'll talk about that text in a moment. Certainly the one who denies that the temporal sword is in the power of Peter has not listened well to the word of the Lord commanding, put up thy sword unto thy scabbard. Both therefore are in the power of the church. That is to say, the spiritual and the material sword. But the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church. The former in the hand of the priest, the latter in the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and sufferance of the priest. Who controls? The church. However, one sword ought to be subordinate to the other, and temporal authority subjected to spiritual power. For since the Apostle said there is no power except from God, and the things that are are ordained of God, Romans 13, 1 and 2, but they would not be ordained if one sword were not subordinate to the other. 
And if the inferior one, inferior one, as it were, were not laid upwards by the other, furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Now, I didn't take this from some obscure source. I made sure I took it directly from the Vatican webpage. So check it out there for yourselves. Now, let's look at this text. Luke twenty-two thirty-five. And he, this is Jesus speaking. How this text has been distorted is amazing. And he said to them, Whence I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lack ye anything? And they said, nothing. Okay, and let's just get one thing clear. God's people, how did he send them out? Without scrip, without purse, right? Now he's saying, then said he unto them, But now he that has a purse, how were they sent out? Help me. Without purse. So now he's referring to another class. Those that have the purse. Those that have the power over the economy. Those that have the power over the sword. But now he that has a purse, let him take it. And likewise his scrip, that's his knapsack, and he that has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. This is war. This is war. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned amongst the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. What did Jesus say to them? Jesus said to them, my dear disciples, I don't think you understood what I just said. I said to you, I sent you out without purse. But there's another class that has the purse and that has the sword. And I, the Son of Man, will now be handed over to them. And they will use that authority and they will crucify me. But they didn't understand, so they said, but Lord, look, we've got two swords. And Jesus says, oh, please, I'm not talking about your stupid little sword. It's enough. He's talking about those who wield the authority, those who have the mark of Cain, who are going to kill him. It's not the church that must wield the sword. It is those who rule over the children of evil. Thomas Aquinas said, the Pope by divine right has spiritual and temporal power as supreme king of the world. He is the king. The Pope of Rome, as the head of the papal government, claims absolute sovereignty and supremacy over all the governments of the earth. That is their saying. The right of deposing kings is inherent in the supreme sovereignty of the popes as vice-regent of Christ exercises over all Christian nations. This is what they claim. And whose sign do we see there? We see the sign of Anu, the very one that Maduk wore, the one that emphasizes the power. Now we'll follow it a little bit, but we will do that in the next episode. I'm sure we all need a short break. So let's take a short break and come back for the second half. As we saw in the first half, the rulers who have received power to rule over the children of disobedience have a certain mindset which may be suppressed for long periods of time, but when it manifests itself, it is the same mindset that was manifested by Herod. So the Herodian mind is one that is in enmity with God, even though it has power over God's people. The Herodian mindset will also try to make the worship of God subject to his own ideology, because Herod put the eagle of Rome on the temple of Yahweh that he restored. So this mindset 
can be followed all the way through history. And when it culminates in oppressive regulations and rules which contradict God's law, then God says probation is over. That, in brief summary of what we've said so far, we saw that the Mark of Anu is central to the Roman power. Now, let's have a look at another beast. Revelation 13, 11, Then beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. What kind of power does the first beast claim to have? It says it has two swords. The one is the spiritual power, and the other one is the temporal power, and that the spiritual power is over the temporal power. We saw those papal encyclicals. Who wields the second sword on his behalf in the world we are living in today? Well, the Bible tells us, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon, and he exercises all the power of the first beast before him on his behalf and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So the power, the secular arm of power that he wields and uses is particularly manifested in the second beast, which is the United States of America. And here is the Capitol, and on top of the Capitol you have a female deity, Persephonus, Venus if you like. She is the same as the Ishtar, the ruler of the night. The consort of Marduk, who was given authority to rule over the children of evil. Now, a capitol can only be subject to the god Jupiter because he was the Capitol, and that is the God of Rome. And so we have the similarities in architecture, and the one is subject to the other, but the female deity, the deity of the rulership over the children of darkness, in an occult fashion, contrary to the worship of God, but supposedly subject to him. And it shall come to pass, says 1 Kings 19.17, that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Yehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Yehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. So God uses the temporal power to punish even God's people when they are apostate. And he has done this many times over. Has he not used those who claim rulership of the children of disobedience to punish God's people in the past? Yes or no? He certainly has. And history becomes just so much clearer if we understand these things because people are so confused. How can God do this? How can this happen? We are living on a planet of disobedience. And God, by permitting this, is extending the hour of grace and giving an opportunity. Now the sword that comes out of the mouth of Elijah, is that an earthly sword or is that a spiritual sword? It simply means that those who don't accept the message that comes out of the mouth of Elisha, who wears the cloak of Elijah, in other words, the Elijah message, they will die. They will die. And they will fall subject to the other sword, which is in the hands of Jehu. And he also served the Lord in sorts, but the Bible says his heart was not right and he served other gods and he followed the ways of Jeroboam. 
but he was still used as a sword. But he saves the poor from the sword, from their mouth, from their mouth and from the hand of the mighty. Now the poor here, of course, are those who are destroyed in spirit, those who seek something better, who seek the Lord. This is not talking about literal poverty. And Joab, Joab said, make ready, and his chariot was made ready, and Joram, king of Israel, and Isaiah, king of Judah, went out each in his chariot, and they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. This is a very fascinating story. We'll do a little bit more about this in the second half. Now we know that Ahab coveted Naboth's vineyard and eventually Jezebel, who serves as a type of the church, gave it to him by her authority. But this is where he meets him and it came to pass when jo Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? so long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. That counts for today too. There can be no peace as long as the whoredoms of Jezebel are so many. There can be no peace. It is war from the beginning, and I will put enmity. This war hasn't stopped, but I have got good news for you. It's coming to a head. This is the black obelisk of Shalmaneser III, showing Jehu paying tribute. So here is his obelisk, and there is Jehu, and he is paying tribute. This was a prince of Israel. This is the sword was given to him to correct the faults in Israel. He slew all the descendants of Ahab. And eventually, he also slew Jezebel. Typologically, this is a fascinating story. But there's something else that's very interesting about this. Here is Shalmaneser III, and here is his symbol of authority. Can you see that? So, this man, Jehu, who was ruling and who was king in Israel, was only ruling as king subject to whom? Subject to Shalmaneser. Now, if you take Shalmaneser down the line of history, you go through the Babylonian kings, the same authority stayed with them, then the Medo-Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, and then... Papal Rome. They all followed the same line. And anybody who rules and wields the sword must be subject to the king of Babylon. Now there's something else that's fascinating about this. You can't see the whole of it here, but there's a little bit more in this reconstruction. They're all wearing cute little hats. Jehu is wearing one. There it is. And those carrying the tribute are also wearing some. Can you see that? What is also interesting is that these people have beards. Jehu has a beard, and these have beards. But these two servants of Shalmaneser and that one don't have beards. What does that tell you? They were eunuchs in the court of the king. And because they have this little funny little hat, if you take this hat through, all the way through history, it has a connotation with the god Mitraism. Mitra. But Mitra is just a further continuance of the sun god. And in a sense, later it became the Phrygian cap, and it became the cap of the revolution in France, where freedom was given to the citizens. So the hat, the Phrygian hat, is a symbol of subservience to the sun god, but it is also a symbol of being a free man. And as a free man, you could procreate. You weren't castrated. You could procreate. And you could rule and you could be free on one condition. And that was? 
You can only be free and a free man if you are subject to the ruler who has the sign and the mark of Anu. Then you could be free. Then you could be free. Now, before you go too far, in our previous sermon we said you can either be slaves to righteousness or slaves to unrighteousness. God's people will also bow down to a ruler because the Bible says every knee will bow. That includes God's people, right? But the difference is this. This one is by compulsion and fear. The other one will be out of free choice. So who is really free? Only those who serve Jesus Christ. So this little hat, this Phrygian hat over here, means I am a free man. I am a free man, but I am subservient. Now if you were a part of the occult line, then these symbols were all used. Now in Freemasonry, they trace their origin of their rituals that they have today to the Knights Templars. And they were great builders of castles and banks and builders, builders, builders. Does that remind us of something? Coming down that line? And they were called Freemasons, which means brother masons. But if you transliterate it directly into English, eventually it becomes free mason. And the word free gets another connotation other than a brotherly guild. It's also, I am free. I can be what I want to be provided. I bow. I bow. So the god Mitra wore this little hat as was worn by Jehu. So I don't want the little hat. You can keep it. But the United States Senate has what there in its emblem? The little hat. And the United States military has what there in its symbol? So is it the symbol of subservience to the king of Babylon, yes or no? Yes. And are they free? Yes, they are free maçon. They are free to rule. They are free to exercise the power on behalf of the other one. But they really, they are in bondage to a system. If you want to read an interesting book, then get Rulers of Evil. And it comes out in two covers. One has the God as it is in, on the great dome of the Capitol building, where there is marvelous symbolism. And uh, here you have this female deity wielding the sword over the children of disobedience. And it also has the god Mercury on the dome, the mercurial god, the Pied Piper, who leads by deceit people into Hades, and who is the god of commerce and finances the revolution of the colonies against Britain. All the symbolism is in there. The same as you will find the symbolism in Rome. But this cover is rather revealing because the symbol of Anu is placed on the chest of whom there? Which priest? What kind of priest? Jesuit priest. And I found this fascinating that a man who doesn't have the prophecies that we have and this great privilege that we have can come to such conclusions was mind-boggling. The preface of the book was written by journalist Pat Shannon, and he writes a very fascinating preface. He says, The only people in the world, it seems, who believe in conspiracy theory of history are those of us who have studied it. He makes another statement later on. He says, you will read this book from cover to cover and you will highlight it over and over and over again. He said, make sure that you put it on the bottom of your shelf 
that all your children will someday get hold of it. And then he continues and says, while Franklin D. Roosevelt might have exaggerated when he said nothing happens in politics by accident, if it happens, it was planned that way. Carol Quigley, now let me tell you who Carol Quigley was, he was the Jesuit of Georgetown University who was the lecturer of the presidents that studied there and of all the great people that rule in America, amongst others Bill Clinton. Carol Quigley he writes, Bill Clinton's favorite professor at Georgetown University, boldly admitted in his Tragedy and Hope, written in 1966, that A, the multitudes were already under the control of a small but powerful group bent on world domination, and B, that Quigley, who was a Jesuit himself, was part of that group. So out of the mouth of the professor of Georgetown University, the Jesuit University, he says there's a group, a powerful elite, that rules the world and he's part of it. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I wonder what this man learnt there. Let's see what he learnt. And a special thanks to the members of the Roosevelt family who are here, and to one who is not, Eleanor, who made sure that the four freedoms were included in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. I know that because, as all of you famously learned when I served as president, my wife, now the Secretary of State, was known to commune with Eleanor on a regular basis. And so she called me last night on her way home from Peru to remind me to say that, that Eleanor had talked to her and reminded her that I should say that. Now my question is this. This is a ruler. Is he, was he ruling according to the dictates of God? Yes or no? Judging by what you just heard? No. So he's a ruler over the children who would worship God according to their own methodology. Is that correct? Please don't misunderstand me. God loves them. God reaches out to them. God wants them all to be saved. If he went to the trouble that he went to for Nebuchadnezzar, and he went to the same trouble, even more so, in the case of Herod, then I am convinced that he will do the same for these presidents. Don't misunderstand me. I'm just discussing a historic scenario. So spiritism forms part and parcel of the way in which government is enacted. Because under the Reagan administration, they used astrology and divination to determine how they were going to run things, when they were going to meet, what days they were going to do what, everything ran according to an occult calendar. That's common history. Everybody knows it. And how we have, out of the horse's mouth, that the Secretary of State receives instruction from a deceased individual, probably also as to how to run affairs of state. Now Lorenzo Ricci, the 18th superior general of the Society of Jesus, is a fascinating man because he ruled from 1773 to 1814, which means that he also ruled in the time period when the first beast received a mortal wound. And it is fascinating that the black papacy also received a mortal wound because it was apparently banned and disbanded. But then had a resurrection, just like the white papacy. Now, during the order suppression from 1773 to 1814 by Pope Clement, General Ricci created the Illuminati with his soldiers. He didn't go underground because he was to be destroyed. He went underground because it was convenient. Remember that the first beast seemed to have a mortal wound. It doesn't say it had 
a mortal wound. It seemed to have a mortal wound. Adam Weishaupt, the father of modern communism, who was with the Jacobins who wear the little hat, who may rule subservient to the system, conducted the French Revolution. Years later, Jesuit General Ledochovsky, this one, with his Bolsheviks, conducted the Russian Revolution, 1917, it being identical to the upheaval of 1789, history of the Jesuits. So who fermented this tremendous political upheaval? The Jesuits, behind the scenes. They are the secret rulers of evil. Ex-Guatemala bishop, and this man actually is a Canadian today. He lives in Canada. He claims Jesuits are the spiritual controllers of the new world order. And this is what he has to say. I'm quoting now some sources for you. I quoted rulers of evil. Now I'm quoting a Catholic bishop. Former Bishop Gareth Buffard of Guatemala said, the Vatican is the real spiritual controller of the Illuminati and the New World Order, while the Jesuits through the Black Pope, Jesuit General Friar Peter Hans Kolvenbach, who is now no longer the general, so he wrote this a little while ago, the present one is Adolfo Nicolas, but they're both still alive, actually control the Vatican hierarchy and the Roman Catholic Church. Bishop Buffard, who left the church and is now born again, Christian, living in Canada, based his conclusion after working six years as Vatican priest, assigned the task of passing daily sensitive correspondence between the Pope and the leaders of the Jesuit order residing at Borgo Santo Spirito, 5 near St. Peter's Square. Yes, the man known as the Black Pope controls all major decisions made by the Pope, and he in turn controls the Illuminati, said Bishop Buffard last week on Greg Simansky's radio show. The investigative journal, so and so, where archives of the startling statements can be heard in their entirety. I know this to be true since I worked for years in the Vatican and traveled with Pope John Paul II. The Pope takes his marching orders from the Black Pope as the Jesuits also are the leaders of the New World Order with the task of infiltrating other religions and governments of the world in order to bring about a one-world fascist government and a one-world religion based on Satanism and Lucifer. Now, in case someone says I'm a conspiracist, I didn't say it, he said it. <laughs> People can't imagine how evil and how much destruction they have caused and will cause while at the same time using the perfect cover of hiding behind black robes and professing to be men of God. I just want to ask a question. Is what we read here in harmony with what we read out of the great controversy, yes or no? Yes. And that is the final question. If we can say that book must go to the world, then why is it that we war against what that book has to say? This is the church of the Gesù, Italian Chiesa del Gesù. And notice that it is a G. And in Freemasonry, the letter inside is a G, which has many meanings. The naive will say it means God. No, it will tell you who the real man is behind the power. And in that chapel, you have the famous statue of the church with a, what is that in the hand over here? A lightning bolt. Who carried the lightning bolt in our first little picture? It was Marduk who carried it. And with his lightning bolt, with that power of that divinity, which is a transcript of Cain, who received the power from Anu. With that power, she will destroy Protestantism. This is Luther and Calvin. And that is her mission. If that were not her mission today, why doesn't she cover up this little statue? Why does she leave it there? See, my Lord, from this room, from this room, I govern not only Paris, but China. Not only China, but the whole world, without anyone knowing how it's managed. 
Michelangelo Tamburini, 1720, general of the Jesuits, speaking to the Duke of Brancas. Revelation 17, verse 15 says, And he says unto the me, The waters which thou sawest, where the hall sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. How much does she control? Everything. So what happens in China, what happens in Japan, what happens in Korea, is what's supposed to happen to channel people into a mindset, one mindset, which will finally come into direct conflict with another mindset. Because this is a battle for the mind. Does she control the secret police of the world? The answer is yes. The CIA was formed by Catholic Knight of Malta, William Wilde Bill Donovan. He's considered the father of the CIA. The FBI was also formed by a Knight of Malta, trustee of the Catholic University of America. When Loyola was traveling with the permission of the Pope to Jerusalem, a Knight of Malta, a high general of the Knights of Malta, was with him on the ship. And Loyola received the secrets of the power structure directly from the Knights of Malta. So the two are really one today. That's history. You can check it out. The grand design exposed. The truth is the Jesuits of Rome have perfected Freemasonry to be their most magnificent and effective tool accomplishing their purpose among Protestants. So in Protestant nations, the Freemason organizations all feel very comfortable, but the stop structure is subject to someone they don't even know who it is. And that someone is the Black Pope in Rome. Malachi Martin, who was strangely removed from this planet, said it is a strange phenomenon in history of the Roman Church that every time there's a crisis of extraordinary value, New Masonic orders are called forth, and that is how the Jesuit came into being. It took over the top structure. It received it as a gift. It was the new ruler on this planet. So if you go to the Capitol, it is a temple of Jupiter, and on top of it sits the goddess. And it's interesting that the Capitoline Venus, this great statue in Rome, that was removed only once during the French Revolution from Rome when the papacy received a mortal wound, was recently sent to Washington as a symbol of their unity. And Washington, of course, laid the cornerstone Masonically. Now, this is the great Scottish rite of Freemasonry, Supreme Council, 33 degree. Now, it is a museum but parts of it are open to the public. But uh, as you all know, we are a little bit naughty, my friend in the back there and I. And so while they were showing us around, we managed to sneak off into other places. (laughs) But this is where the great leaders actually meet after their decisions are made in the Senates and other places, and the real power is determined over here. So we took some pictures that were not part of the tour. And uh, what do you see as you come in? There you see the sign of Anu as worn by Shamash and Maduk. This is in this lodge where the leadership of the United States meets. Now we're just going to go through. And you see its symbol over there, which is the symbol of power. Here's the Supreme Court of the United States. What is the symbol that you see on the wall over there? It's the exact same symbol. We are rulers over the powers of evil. And we will keep them in check. We will make laws. And we will make everybody subject to our laws. But the supreme leaders also have another criterion. They are in conflict with God and with the followers of God. And their intent eventually is always 
to get rid of Abel, or to get rid of the children of Israel, or to get rid of the Prince of Peace, or to get rid of those who followed the Prince of Peace, or to get rid of the remnant of the remnant. Do you see the picture throughout history? Is there any reason why it shouldn't repeat itself? So the sign of Anu is on the Supreme Court of the United States of America. Now I'll take you down into the places where they didn't take us. Welcome to the J. Edgar Hoover Room dedicated to your law enforcement community. And then there's something written here which is hard to read unless you carefully look at it, so I wrote it out for you. The most effective weapon against crime is cooperation, the effort of all law enforcement agency with the support and understanding of the American people. Who wields the sword? The United States of America. On behalf of whom? On behalf of the first piece. The secular power is subject to the spiritual power. FBI activities begun under Mr. Hoover's era. And there are some of the examples. And just to make sure you know what went on with him, he must have been at least a 32 degree Freemason because he's a Shriner and you have to be a 32 degree Freemason to be that, but he was probably 33. So there he is. It's interesting that he has the symbol of the, the moon and the star. We think it is Islam, it has nothing to do with it. It is the symbol of Isis and Horus. It is that symbol of power given by that first parent, given by Cain and his wife to their son, Enoch. And down through the line, through masonry, according to Pike, who traces their history back to the power of Enoch to rule. Here he's shaking hands with the President of the United States, Eisenhower. Our new cities. Are they builders of cities? Yes, very much so. Who's this gentleman? This is taken in that lodge, by the way, in that room. In that room, in that lodge. That's Billy Graham, shaking hands with Hoover. There he is with the Pope. And he declared the Pope to be the moral leader of the world. Is that Jehu bowing down? Yes or no? And here you have Norman Vincent Peale, 33 degree Freemason. Took this picture myself down there in the 33 degree Washington Lodge. This is the father of the modern mega church. This is the father of the modern methodology used in the church. Who is he subject to if Rome says that the temporal power is subject to the spiritual power and that spiritual power resides in Rome? He is the father of the mega church movement. He was the mentor of Robert Schuller, who became the mentor of Hybels and of Rick Warren. And the whole plethora of modern theology comes out of this temple lodge. Here is Harry Truman, 33 degree Freemason, and there is the altar inside that shrine. Now, if you look at that altar, it's a replica of what? It's a replica of the altar of offering that was used by the Hebrews. But on top of it is not only the Bible, but the Bhagavad Gita, the Tanakh, the Quran, and the Bible. What does that symbolize? That all religions will be fused into one. So is this children of obedience or children of disobedience? Is this a way to God? of your own devising, or is it the way, the truth, and the life, nobody comes to the Father except by me? Well, we can see that quite clearly. Alice A. Bailey, founders of Lucifer Trust, said, there will be no dissociation between the universal church, the sacred lodge of all true masons, and the inner circle of the esoteric societies. 
In this way, the goals and the work of the United Nations will be solidified and a new church of God, led by all the religions and by all the spiritual groups, shall put to an end the great heresy of separateness. So if the Bible says come out and be separate and have nothing to do with this kind of worship, they say the opposite. So these are rulers of evil. Another 33 degree Freemason, we Senator Dole, and here you have Burke showing that the military power is also under their control. This is all taken directly from the pictures hanging down there. And we also happen to step on the holy ground of Albert Pike's grave, and they were horrified. Oh, you're standing on holy ground. What's so holy about it? Pike is here. <laughs> Unbelievable. Bernstein noted that the leading American players behind Reagan Vatican conspiracy to a man were devout Roman Catholics, namely William Casey. Now, this book was written in 1971. This is Rulers of Evil. I just want you to note the names and see where these people or some of them are today. William Casey was then, at that time, director of the CIA, Richard Allen, national security advisor, national security advisor, and the High Secretary of State, ambassador at large, Vernon Walters, ambassador to the Vatican, Wilson. But the reporter neglected to mention that the entire Senate Foreign Relations Committee was governed by Roman Catholics as well, especially Joe Biden. Where's he today? Subcommittee on European Affairs, Paul Sabanis, International Economic Policy and Oceans and Environment, Mayoyan. John Kerry, where's he today? Terrorism, narcotics, and international communications was his portfolio then. So, do they control very interesting aspects? Fascinating. And of course, they were bonesmen, as we know. Now people will start shouting conspiracy. This is not conspiracy, this is fact. This is not conspiracy. Now let's have a look at some modern people. Leon Panetta. He was the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency. Leon Edward Panetta is an American politician, lawyer, and professor. He served in Barack Obama's administration as director of the Central Intelligence Agency from 2009 to 11, and as Secretary of Defense from 2011 to 2013. In 1956, he entered Santa Clara University. And in 1960, he graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. He also received a Juris Doctor from Santa Clara University. He joined the United States Army, etc., etc., etc. He received the Army Commendation Medal and was discharged in 1966 as First Lieutenant. So running these mighty organizations, we have Roman Catholic agents. Al Jazeera says the dangerous rebranding of John Brennan. He's the current director of the CIA. Now where does he get his training? How does this happen? How can a constitutional law professor and community activist and a Jesuit trained intelligent analyst with an interest in just war theory so easily distort language, etc., etc.? I'm not really interested in the details. Who controls him? He's Jesuit trained. Bill Clinton was Jesuit trained. The CIA, the FBI, to this day, they were founded by agents of Rome, and today, agents of Rome are controlling them today. Nothing has changed. The Tower of Babel, and here you have the Queen of Heaven and her little child, Horus, on the Tower of Babel. Rome makes no doubt, makes no secret of its affiliations. It associates itself with the Tower of Babel. She's the queen, queen of Babel. God divided the nations. And it's been Satan's aim to reunite them in apostasy against God. And we are heading for that final apostasy. The European Parliament building is nothing other than a reconstruction of the Tower of Babel. This was at the London Olympics. There you had the five rings of the Olympics, which symbolized the union of the five continents. A one-world government. But it's not complete until the capstone comes down on it. 
And who's the goddess of the night? Isis. And so they planned it precisely according to the astrological and astronomical calendar so that the full moon would rise and join the rings to complete the pyramid. And whether it's inverted or whether it's upright makes no difference. The one is the male factor, the other one is the female factor. The world is coming to the point when this one world unity, which will be in opposition to God, is coming into effect. This is the journal America, the National Catholic Review. It is a Jesuit journal. So let's ask the Jesuits to explain who the president of the European Council today is. He was educated at the Katholieke Universiteit Leuven, which is dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus under a traditional attribute, the seat of wisdom. We'll have to talk about that. Now let's see what the Jesuit journal has to say. One interesting thing about Mr. Ron van Rompuy is his Catholicism, about which he makes no bones. He was educated, drum roll, s'il vous plaît, <laughs> by Jesuits in Brussels. The top leaders in the world are Jesuits or Jesuit trained. They wield the power. This is the emblem of Georgetown University. This is taken directly from their webpage. The seal of Georgetown University, it bears the founding date, 1789. The university motto, Trac Unum, both into one. And Latin inscription, Collegium Georgio Platanum at Ripas, whatever, which means Georgetown College on the banks of the Potomac in Maryland. This is where the presidents get educated. This is where the legislators get edu educated. They have the Roman eagle, and it says, both into one. If you check a little bit further on their webpage, they will lie to you, or on other webpages about this, and they will say to you, oh, this is uh, the dividing line between the Jew and the Gentile that has been taken away, and they have been united. Nonsense. This is the union of church and state. The union of church and state. This is what will be achieved, whether we like it or not, and it will be under the auspices of the Roman eagle. And that is why there's a holy alliance which was formed between the two, and the eagle forms part of the Pontifex Maximus symbol on the very seat of his power, I took that picture in the Vatican on the floor as you enter St. Peter's. And there is the emblem. And this is the symbol of the United States of America, and it has exactly the same thing. Here it says, in Latin, he, God, favored our undertaking and a new order of the ages. You know these things. Here is the symbol of the eagle in Rome under the papal keys on the coin of the Vatican, and here is the famous eagle as it is in the garden of the Vatican, sculpted by Pope Paul V. Now, this is a statement that some say he never made, but many claim that he did make it, and even if he didn't make it exactly like this, it is found in others of his writings almost like this, so we can say it's quite authoritative. Woodrow Wilson wrote, I'm a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is controlled by its system of credit. Our system of credit is concentrated. The growth of the nation, therefore, and all our activities are on the hands of a few men. We have come to be one of the worst ruled, one of the most completely controlled and dominated governments in the civilized world. No longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. And he said that after he signed into law the Federal Reserve. Now, this is the Globe and Mail business report, 10 September 2013. The CEOs of some of the world's top mining companies 
did not come to the Vatican to pray. See Pope Francis or traipse through the sweltering halls of the Vatican Museum. They came to discuss ways to make their industry a little bit less devilish. And you have to give the Vatican credit for all-star drawing power. Any mining conference would have been envious of the guest list. Saturday's Day of Reflection with the Mining Industry, which was organized by the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace, the Vatican Department that deals with earthly matters such as promoting human rights, included the CNOs, CEOs of Anglo-American, PLC, Rio Tinto, Newmont Mining. These three men alone represented companies with well more than 100 billion US dollars in market value. Discussions taking place at the Vatican. Bilderberg. 2000 and work 13, welcome to 1984. After 59 years of Bilderberg, guests scuttling through the shadows, ducking lenses, etc., etc., here they come. And there is this lady, Acadia, who is the IMF boss today. She's a Bilderberger. In my previous lecture, I showed that the Bilderbergers were formed and started by the Jesuits. Now here's an interview which is rather fascinating. And this interview, if we can have the sound up in a moment, this interview is with a whistleblower. Now whistleblowers are causing quite a bit of trouble for the current regimes. And this is no ordinary whistleblower. This was one of the advisory lawyers in the International Monetary Fund. This is one of the whistleblowers who blew the whistle on multi-billion frauds and eventually, for her whistleblowing, she got a pink slip. But let's listen to what this person, with her insight within the financial systems of the world, has come up with in her thinking. Hello, I'm Greg Hunter. Welcome to USAWatchdog.com. With us today, a brand new guest. Her name is Karen Houdis. Uh, she is an attorney, she is a banker, and she is a whistleblower. Karen Houdis, thank you so much for joining us today from Maryland. Thank you so much. Well, you work for the World Bank for a better part of 20 years. You are an Ivy League trained attorney. Uh, you are went to Ivy League school. I think you went to Yale. Uh, you uh, you work for the World Bank as a lawyer. You're a banker, and you were a whistleblower inside the World Bank, not just one time, but several times. It crescendoed with a a big, uh, almost a billion dollar, uh, you know, whistleblowing fraud, malfeasance in the World Bank in Indonesia. And for that, you got a pink slip in 2009. Getting back to the Federal Reserve and the Bank for International Settlements, um, these groups are in cahoots with the biggest crooks of all, the Jesuits that bought up Bank of America, and they have little secret deals to try to apportion the riches of the world. And in the meantime, all of the countries of the world know that this thievery is going on. We are talking about the biggest thuggery of all and that is the Jesuits in the Vatican. And let me tell you what I just found out. Um, I always thought that the CIA was the problem and the, you know, the other intelligence agencies. Guess what? There's a grand intelligence agency that the Vatican puts out, and all of those other crooks are operating under the Vatican intelligence agency. The money That's is what's about going on. The money is about the control, and the the Vatican Intelligence Agency, the World Intelligence Agency, they're talking about we're fighting over money, over what money we're going to use, no, and who controls the money. No, that's the, the, the money. thing I'm saying, Greg. They're not fighting. They've all agreed. The fighting is what we're led to believe. They're all in cahoots, just like all the banks are in cahoots. All of these intelligence agencies are in cahoots, too. For example, people don't know that their IRS revenue is going to the Vatican. Now, there's a whistleblower. And I don't think she's a fool. I think she saw through it. Pope John XXIII made the following statement. The mark of Cain is stamped upon our foreheads. Across the countries, our brother Abel was slain in the blood which we drew and shed tears we caused by forgetting thy love. Forgive us, Lord, for the curse we falsely attributed to their name as Jews. Forgive us for crucifying thee a second time in their flesh, for we knew not what we did. 
Now, lest I be accused of being an anti-Semite, I am not. Lest I be accused of being an anti-Catholic, I am not. I'm not anti-anyone, I'm just pro-Jesus Christ. <laughs> but, he claims the mark of Cain is stamped upon their foreheads. He's just stating a fact, he knows it. They have the mark of Cain. They have the authority to rule. And they are exercising the authority. And what he says is that they slew Abel all over again in the form of the Jews, but they want to be forgiven for that. Does he ask forgiveness for the Inquisition and the slaughter of millions of Christians? No. Because those who reject Christ are part of his mindset. So all that he has done in the statement has said the mark of Cain is on upon our forehead and we welcome into our midst anyone who has the same enmity against Jesus Christ. That's all he's saying. But they're clever. They hide it under this language so that you will not see it. Netanyahu thanks the Pope for Jewish exoneration. So Pope Benedict went a step further and exonerated them from the guilt of the crucifixion. He's very kind. He wields the power. He has the mark of Anu. He can do it. Sunday is the, our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. Catholic record. A person who violates the sanctity of Sunday is to be punished as a heretic, John Paul II. The EU must keep Sunday, says the Catholic Church. Is it directing its attention against God's law in the public domain, yes or no? Yes. Catholic Church and trade unions form holy alliance to a forced Sunday observance. Let me take you down into the bellows of that 33-degree lodge in Washington. And this is Albert Pike's room. He is uh, revered as a god down there. Everything is meticulous. And there on, one, on the windows it says, Ordo ab chaos, Order out of chaos. We know that he planned... Albert Pike planned three world wars in a letter to Mancini. We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formidable social cataclysm, which in its horror will show clearly that to the nations the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the minority of revolutionists will exterminate those destroyers of civilization, and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity will receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Here is the gigantic mural in the United Nations Security Council chamber. And there you see the phoenix rising out of the ashes of a destroyed mankind. Are we heading for the final clash? Two lines, the rule of law and the rule of the spirit. This is now a definition from legal dictionary. The rule of law according to law, rule under law, rule according to a higher law. The rule of law is an ambiguous term that can mean different things in different contexts. In one context, the term means rule according to the law. No individual can be ordered by the government to pay civil damages or suffer criminal punishment except in strict accordance with the well-established and clearly defined laws and procedures. And in the second context, the term means rule under law. No branch of government is above the law. No public official may act arbitrary or unilaterally outside the law. In a third context, the term means rule according to a higher law. No written law may be enforced by a governor unless it conforms with certain unwritten universal principles of fairness, morality, and justice that transcend human legal systems. I wonder what that law is. 
There must be natural law. And who wields natural law? Rome. Rome is the father and the mother of natural law. So she controls all law. She has the mark of Cain. And she says, the sign that I have this authority in the world, a God-given authority, by the way, God permits her to bear that responsibility, is my mark of power. And that is that I change the Sabbath to Sunday. Now we've all seen this one before, but I just want to emphasize the words rule of law. Let's hear the song. For institutions of freedom have lain dormant, the United Nations can offer them new life. These institutions play a crucial role in our quest for a new world order. An order in which no nation must surrender one iota of its own sovereignty, an order characterized by the rule of law rather than the resort to force. Everybody must be subject to the what? The rule of law. And the rule of law is subject to a higher law. And that law is wielded by another authority behind the scenes. That's the legal definition. The only one who has ever laid claim to such a law is the Roman Catholic Church. And so principalities and powers will have to come and pay obeyance. And so Obama will go. He was educated at Harvard. If you enter the Harvard Law School, what is the sign that you see there? The sign of Anu. So here is the power to rule. Battlefield, U.S. Americans face arrest as war criminals under army state law. Luke 21, 26, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. We are heading for a final cataclysm. Senate approves indefinite detention and torture of Americans. The terrifying legislation that allows for Americans to be arrested, detained, indefinitely tortured and interrogated without charge or trial passed through the Senate on Thursday. Is it only applicable to Americans or is the same thing happening to other nations as well? Do they use torture at Guantanamo Bay, yes or no? Is it a common known fact? Do they use waterboarding and other methods that we don't know of? Well, why would the U.S. clergy seek release of a Senate report on post-9-11 torture if there weren't torture? Now I want to remind you of history. Did the nations in the past employ torture to those who differed from their principles? Yes or no? Did the Syrians do it? Yes. And if you go down the line, did the Romans do it? Yes. And whenever it came to that point, once they reach a certain point, 70 times 7, when probation closes for them, it ends. But normally these nations became cruel and tortured people. Are they showing pictures of people in terrible states with chemicals on them and all kinds of stuff like that? Who supplies these things? Who makes it possible for them to use it? Whoever uses it. I'm not interested in who is using it. I'm not accusing anyone. I'm saying that the children of evil, of children who rule over the children of evil, are using the methodologies which the Bible describes throughout history. And we are at that point in history. Did Obama sign a martial law, executive order, as folks headed to happy hour last Friday? President Obama signed an executive order that could, could potentially give him the power of instituting martial law, even in a time of peace. Verizon forced to hand over telephone data, full court ruling. Are you being watched? Did Herod have a secret police force that dragged any dissident to justice, which he was permitted to to bring about. Absolutely. Are we at that same point in history? There's only one little difference. All those others served this type, and they were all local. But this one 
is universal. This is the last one. Huffington Post denounces George W. Obama. <laughs> it's beautiful. There they have George Bush, and there you have Obama listening to your conversations. And they fused the two brilliantly into George W. Obama. What does that picture say? <laughs> the picture says it doesn't make any difference whether it's the one ruling or the other. The same power behind the scene controls them both. When Obama came to power, he screamed about all the irregularities and terrible laws that the previous one had made. Did he rescind one? No. Not one. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are. Again, I purposely choose great controversy because we as a people believe that this must be given to the world. Only when it is too late to escape the snare she is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches and in the hearts of men. She is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. I don't want to speak about FEMA camps and this and that and the other. I don't care how many bunkers they build or how many camps they build. I know one thing that the confrontation will be between the powers of evil and the powers of good. And the only power that can control the power of evil is Jesus Christ himself. And I'm but a pawn in this game. But I can choose sides. I can choose sides. And the Lord can spare me from the sword if he so wishes. And even if he doesn't, he can resurrect me. But the other one can't. Stealthily and unsuspectedly she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when the time shall come for her to strike. My church is basking in the sunshine of her acceptance. Mm. Sitting in the sunshine, moving her little feet in ecstasy. Don't you know where you are sitting? Don't you know what can happen to you? Don't you know that you can be grabbed at any moment? All that she desires is vantage ground, and this is already being given her. We shall soon see and shall feel what the purpose of the Roman element is. Whoever shall believe and obey the word of God will thereby incur reproach and persecution. Make no bones about it. On the same day that President Obama called for a new international order to solve the challenges of our time, Pope Benedict called for a new international order. Both of them are accustomed to interesting hand signs, as we see, with both hands. Time magazine, a new world pope. Meet the press, Jesuit priest and Ignatius Press founder Joseph Fessio said, those who rebel against the church's authentic teaching are rebelling against God. Rebelling against which God? Revelation 19, 15, and out of, the mouth, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, note this text. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power. They are permitted to rule. They have been granted by God the mark of Cain. They can exercise their power to a limit which God sets. And when that limit comes, he ends it. He's done it through history. We've looked at it. And we are at the point when the same principles that applied to the close of probation in all the other kingdoms are coming to a head in our time. If people do not want to see it, that's their business. 
but it is my duty, my duty to make them aware of the danger that they are in. And I appeal to my church and I appeal to the world to look at the Protestant heritage and to look at what we taught as a church and to warn the people of the coming danger rather than cuddling up to that. It is now time to make a decision and may God help us to make the right one. Amen.